If you don't have a Bible, just hold your right hand up as we do our Bible confession. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. Today I will receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I'll tell you, on this chilly morning outside, boy, I came to work, and while it was still dark <laughs> this morning, and ow, that cold just shot right through me. It's time to pull out the long johns and everything else, right? <laughs> As we continue in our journey on the Agape Road, um, I think so far one of the most important things that we've learned is that as we continue to abide, uh, you know, with our Heavenly Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in that ongoing, unbroken fellowship, we end up becoming more like His Son. We end up sounding more like Him, looking more like Him. And, and that's God's will for us. You know, as we've learned in weeks past in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that, uh, you know, we were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of a son. Or in Philippians chapter 2, that we're to have that same attitude. It's God's will that this process happens. Now, if that's true, and indeed the Word of God is true, then we need to look at the life of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Who in, in Jesus' earthly ministry, as it's recorded in the, in the Gospels, did Jesus seek to please in his life? The crowd, Rome, Pilate, who did he seek to please? You can answer. The Father, that's right. And, and you know, that's affirmed in John chapter 5, verse 30. Here's another question. Whose will did Jesus seek to do in his earthly ministry? The will of the crowd? The will of his mother? Whose will? Exactly. As affirmed in John 7, verse 38. Lastly, whose commands did Jesus seek to obey? Was it the commands of the government or the powers to be in the world or the authorities? Whose command? Well, if indeed these statements are true and the word of God is true, then my friend, where was Jesus' focus throughout his early ministry? Uh, throughout his earthly ministry? Where was it at? On the, on the Father. Now, if we're to be conformed to the image of God's Son in this life, if someone examined your life right now, what would they see? you know, by the way you live out your life, what would they determine your passion would be and your desires, you know, for this world and for the life that you live? Now, I think the majority of us who are Christians would want to be able to say, well, my dearest passions and desires are for God and the, and the work of the Lord here in this world. But I think if we were hard-pressed, the majority of church-going folks would have to say, unfortunately, that the majority of my time, energy, money, and my thoughts are going more to my family, or if you're a single person, to your girlfriend, boyfriend, to my work, my job, and all that's related to that, or my activities and, and my interest. And you know, when we think about um, the dividing up of our time, we realize that none of these things are evil or unworthy of our time. I mean, work, family, I mean, Jesus said, let's face it, folks, we weren't called to live in a monastery like a monk, all right? Jesus said in John 17 in his prayer, Father, not that you take them out of the world, but that they remain in the world. You know, we're going to, all of us, have to deal with issues of how much time we allow for all of these things, and none of them are evil or unworthy of our time. The problem comes in, ladies and gentlemen, when we so center on one of these things or several of these things that we lose our eternal focus on God. When these things become so predominant in our lives that we lose our eternal focus, then we run into danger. You see, the problem arises in terms of priorities the fact that we were created, you know, with a desire and a longing for, for God in our life, you know, that force in our life is constantly having to combat what we talked about weeks ago, the force of eros. And remember, eros love is the opposite of agape. You know, eros is self-centered behavior, primarily motivated by our sinful nature. And that competes for our attention. 
and competes for the center of our life and the center of our heart with agape. It tries, you know, the way it works is that Eros tries to crowd out agape by getting us focused on these other things where we'll get off that agape road and follow some other detours. Well, I think the biggest thing that uh, you know, we need to do is, is not be distracted. But it's so easy to be, isn't it, in our human nature? I mean, Adam and Eve are a classic example of how easy it is for us as human beings to get distracted. Think about this for a moment. Here's Adam and Eve, you know, our first parents. They were in a beautiful garden. Sin had not entered into the world at that time, so they had unbroken fellowship with God. But along one day comes Satan, you know, who tells them, you know, I think that you're really missing something by not eating that, you know, that tree with the forbidden food. And of course, uh, that put the focus then on that one tree out of all the garden where they could eat, okay, and all the things they could enjoy, what happened? As soon as that was mentioned, you know, suddenly their self-interest overcame their desire to please God, and a bad choice was made that affected us all. You see, I think the, uh, whenever something is focused, you know, whenever we focus on something, it seems to expand that something. For instance, okay, example. If I told you now, you know, with my, on my pants, shirt, and suit, I have ten pockets, five of my, my suit coat, and then five more of my shirt and pants. Now, if I told, if I was talking to a bunch of first, second, and third graders, and I told them, boys and girls, you could have anything, and I've got some good things in my pockets, you could have anything in any one of my pockets, you're welcome to go in there and investigate, except for this pocket right here. Where do you think the attention would be focused suddenly <laughs> in those first, second, and third graders? Okay? And if that's true with children, it doesn't stop being true with those of us who are adults. Whatever we focus on, listen, whatever we focus on expands. Would you say that after me? Whatever we focus on expands. Therefore, it's really important that we keep our focus on God. But, you know, but how do we go about doing that? When we're talking about uh, changing our focus, how do we do that? Let me point, you out, uh, point your direction right now, your attention, to a scripture passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 28. Turn there, if you would, please. In the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning in verse 28. Jesus spoke some words in this particular passage that really causes us to do some real deep thinking when it comes to being able to change our focus off the things below onto the things above. We first need to hear the Word of God. Now in verse 28, reading from an NIV translation, listen to what our Lord said as he was doing some teaching on one occasion in, during his earthly ministry. He said to the crowd and his disciples, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and gone tomorrow and is thrown in the fire, really not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Boy, some powerful words from our Lord, right? You know, what did he mean by that statement, seek first the kingdom? It's very obvious. He was saying that, that God ought to be our first priority. That ought to be our main focus in our life, ought to be God. And it comes with a promise, okay? That was the injunction, but the promise is this, that if we do that and God becomes our main focus, all the other things that are important in life, again, I affirm the fact, these things aren't evil, you know, home, job, you know, care, money, pay the bills, you know, activities, hobbies, good health, they're all part of life. But you see, the idea that this verse is, uh, is sharing to our hearts this morning is that when we focus on God and he becomes our number one, every other thing, all the other things in our life begin to fall into place. They all begin to fall into place. You know, Jesus told a parable um, uh, in, in the Gospels in Ch uh, Luke chapter 12. He said, he was talking about a man who, um, who had a great bountiful crop. And he was so impressed by the good harvest that he had that he decided to build a, big, a, build a bigger barn that he could raise more crops to store more food. And his whole focus, this farmer, began to go on how much he can accumulate, how much of the things and possessions, in this case crops, in barns, and, you know, and, and things that he could gather together. But then Jesus said, one night he died in the midst of all that gathering and collecting and seeking to possess. He died. 
And the simple point, but the very profound truth that Jesus made, was that in light of eternity, all the things we chase after in this world are very pale in comparison. I mean, you know, eternity has a way of putting a perspective on our priorities, right? And on what we need to be doing. And, you know, when we think about that, we realize that Jesus also said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Do not put your heart on things below, but things above, because where your heart is, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. You know, the world's way of, uh, of being able to change one's focus is to put your focus or put your, uh, your mind and set your ambitions on the problem or the behavior problem that you're experiencing. I got a pack of cigarettes here. Now, I don't smoke, all right? I borrow these, okay? But I want to make a point with this pack of cigarettes. These things ended up putting my father in the grave, but it wasn't these things. It was his desire for cigarettes. I mean, the world says that if you're going to kick the habit, man, and, I, and believe me, I have nothing against cigarette smokers here in the building, all right? Except that it does ruin your health. I'm not trying to, you know, mess with you or get in your business. I want to just make a point here, so listen carefully. If I, if I say to myself, you know, I want to quit smoking, and I put all my focus on the whole issue of smoking, what's going to happen? Remember, things that we focus on, say it, folks, expand. That's right. You know, suddenly I'm, I'm thinking about quitting or cutting back, and the focus is on that, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of, of my problem. I become problem conscious. I'm so problem conscious, I can't be God conscious, and therefore my desire increases for the cigarettes. The more I'm focusing on, the more my desire increases, and I just can't kick the habit. My dad, you know, he had his first heart attack when I was still in high school, laid him out, the stretchers came, took him to the hospital. The doctor said, Al, you quit smoking. You're going to have emphysema. It's going to ruin your health. Well, you know, he went back, I'm sure, determined not to do it. My mother, boy, she'd get on him, but he would sneak in the backyard, you know, when she wasn't looking. And he had the cigarettes, you know, stashed somewhere under the car or something, I don't know, by the tire, pull them out and start puffing away. She'd see him out there. I'm, I remember my mother running out, pounding him on the back, said, Al, I told you to quit that smoking, you know. And he said, oh, yeah, 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 and crush him out and then go buy another pack. And it, it, it killed, it, you know, God bless him. He died of emphysema, 57 years of age. Because whatever you focus on expands. That's not the way you change your focus. My friend, only agape love. Listen, only agape love, God's love, gives us the power to overcome. I mean, Paul said the law, I knew the law, thou shalt not commit adultery, you know, lust after other one, thou shalt not covet this, covet that, thou shalt not steal. You know, the law, the law only makes me aware of what a sinner I am. It don't help me to overcome it. The only thing that can help us overcome, to live that overcoming victorious life and walk the agape road is God's love. In other words, folks, when we begin to realize how much he loves us and we make time to enter into that love relationship and spend time with him and walk with him and get to know how much he had to sacrifice his only begotten son to save us and how much as a heavenly father, like Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 6, that he wants to give us good things because he's a loving father. When we realize that, we overcome. I want to give you an illustration from a very, very popular movie. It's taken our country by storm, ladies and gentlemen, and I recommend it for every single person in this building to go see it. There's a new movie called um, Remember the Titans. You may have seen it advertised. And I want to draw an example from that movie because one of the most powerful scenes in the movie illustrates what I'm talking about, about the power of love to help us change our focus and put it on things above, not below. For those of how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many have seen that movie? Okay, there's several. Uh, for those of you that haven't, let me give you a little uh, idea of what it's about. It's uh, based on a true story that happened in Virginia to a high school, actually two high schools, in 1971 there, when there was forced integration going on. Um, some of you back, you know, around at that time as adults might remember hearing about this story. Um, this high, there were two high schools, one all predominantly all Afro-American, the other uh, Caucasian, had to merge together and thus the football team at this particular high school also had to integrate. So there were blacks and whites for the very first time, it never happened before. And of course the story centers on the struggle between, you know, the white players on the football team and the white coach and the black players and the black coach, you know, trying to make a team get along, overcome prejudice, and, and to move on. Well, the movie inevitably shows how they were able to do that. And, uh, you know, because of the, the perseverance of both coaches. But the, the main character, one of the main characters, and, and by the way, they interviewed this man uh, apparently on a news station. Uh, he's in his 70s now to find out if the movie actually depicted the real thing that happened. I mean, if it was, was it the real McCoy or just Hollywood? He affirmed that this was the closest to reality 
uh, that a movie can come. When they integrated the two schools in the football team, they put a black coach uh, as head coach, and he had to become an assistant coach. It was a dash to his pride and ego, especially for the fact that the white coach was about to be inducted into the Hall of Fame of high school coaches. And of course, right about that time, you know, the movie shows the struggle of the two coaches, the black one and the white one, grappling and, and trying to get along with each other, make a winning football team. Well, the football team ended up becoming, becoming a winning team. It shows how the players overcame a lot of things. Well, they're on their way, you know, to, to the playoffs and state championship when suddenly, as they, after they'd won a series of games, were now in the playoffs, a party was held for the white coach. Some of the political powers to be got him in there and said, you know, coach, we want to let you know, after this game tomorrow night, you're going to become the coach again, and that black coach is out of here, and you're going to get in the Hall of Fame. We fixed it with some referees that that, that game is going to be lost, and uh, don't you worry about it. You just keep your mouth shut, and everything's going to be okay. Well, when the day of the game comes, the real part of the movie that just grabbed hold of my heart, and this is a true story, folks, is as the game was happening and the white coach was knowing that the referees were paid off, to call fouls on the team, you know, and do everything they could to cause the Titans to lose. As he was watching this scene, thinking about that Hall of Fame, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, and all of the glory and the power and prominence of that position, and being head coach again, just playing on his ego, his arrows, okay? The arrows love, the self-referential love, all right? All that time he's struggling, but here, in a captivating scene in the movie, while the coach is looking at the game, he looks up and sees this little girl. He was a single parent raising a little daughter who loved football. And his little girl is up in the stands and she's just going crazy while the football team's losing because she knows the coaches are, you know, or the referees are calling you know, things that weren't right. And she's jumping up and down and the coach turns up, looks at his daughter's face, looks back at the game, perhaps thinking about that Hall of Fame, looks back at his daughter and then determines in his mind, she's counting on me. My little girl loves me. And she's counting on me to be a man of integrity, to do what's right. So you see his face go from his daughter to the playing field. And the love for his little girl that rekindled and reminded him of what it means to be a man of integrity won over. And he went up to that referee, grabbed him, he says, buddy, I know what's going on and what's coming down and what you're doing. If you don't stop it right now and play this game fair, I'm going to blow the whistle on this whole scam. And then, of course, as the movie goes, the Titans end up winning the game, winning the championship. The powers to be came down and grabbed hold of the coach and said, that's it for you, buddy. No Hall of Fame for you. And as he turns around, he walks over and his little girl runs in his arms and grabs him and hugs him. Daddy, I'm so proud of you. And the black coach says, you're Hall of Fame material to me, buddy. Now, folks, think with me for a moment. The same power of love that caused a daddy to forsake a, a big important thing that he really wanted, but he had, to, he had to be do unethical things to get there. The power of a love for a daughter in the realization that she's counting on him to be a man of integrity, to do what's right, helped him overcome a negative, you know, desire that would only cause him to feel horrible about himself one day. Do you see, in the same way, listen folks, your heavenly father, when you discover how much God loves you, what he did to give his only begotten son to die on Calvary's cross for your sin, that he loves you right now, man. He's right there in your court. He wants to give you good things. If you'll hold on, wait, trust him, not sell out. Don't do things because of the power of the flesh, but realize that the Father rules you with his love. He courts you, and as you begin to develop intimacy with him, his love gives us the power to overcome. Hallelujah! His love to overcome. You can do it. The power of God's love. You know, we can learn a lot from an acorn. Now, I, I got one visual here I want to show you, okay? That's a little oak tree, right? Courtesy of Gene Milstead. <laughs> now, in my hand, how can an acorn give us hope as Christians? This is a little acorn right here. Look at this thing, huh? I don't know if you can see it way back there. It's a little teeny acorn. Did you realize, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, that inside this little tiny acorn is all the DNA necessary to become a huge oak tree? like the ones out and back. Now admittedly, you know, this little acorn sure enough don't look like this, this plant, does it? 
doesn't have any leaves, you know, no, no big limbs. But inside this acorn is all the potential, all the DNA necessary to become, first of all, it's a process now. They don't jump out to become a big oak like, like those uh, great old holy oaks behind us here, behind the church. But you see, it starts out and it grows because it has the potential within it that was there in the beginning when it was still an acorn. Now you may not be a spiritual oak, but you are a spiritual acorn. If you've been born again by the power of Almighty God, you remember, flashing back a few weeks here, folks, remember, when you're saved, what happens? Remember this from a few weeks ago. You are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ at your rebirth. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you received your white robe, your wedding garment. You have everything potentially you need. You have all the spiritual DNA to become a strong, mighty oak for Jesus Christ. And all God's waiting to do is for us to draw close to him in praise. And he does what, folks? He will impart all the DNA spiritually, that, you've been, that you received that conversion, it will be inside of you. When it comes inside of you and you develop that love relationship, you're going to look like Jesus Christ. You're going to sound like the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. You'll never be perfect this side of heaven. That's why he put those passages in the Bible, like 1 John 1, 9, you know, about forgiveness and how to get forgiveness, because we are going to blow it. It's not that God's waiting for you to get perfect to use you. Don't you think that? There was no man or woman in the Bible that was perfect. If you go back and look at the ones Jesus used, look at David. He was a murderer and an adulterer. God used him. Peter denied him. Paul persecuted his church. He didn't wait for those men to get perfect when he came to them. He was willing to use vessels not that are perfect, but vessels that are broken. If you'll be broken before God and say, Lord, I don't have it, but I know you do. It's the love relationship and the power of agape flowing through us that will give us the victory to overcome. Then if you stumble and fall, remember you're not perfect, and he knows that. You just confess it, get back in the game again. But allow God to grant you what he wants to give you, my friend. He wants to give you his love. He wants to give you his love. You are, if you feel led, just a, by way of a statement of affirmation, would you say, I am a spiritual acorn? On my way to becoming a big oak. <laughs> Yar. The Bible says in closing that God inhabits the praise of his people. How do you get started in changing your focus? How do you get started in discovering the love of God? My friend, I want you to repeat after me something, that um, a verse that I think will help us get started here, okay? If you'll say this verse after me. To him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve this God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Now would you stand? I want you to find a point somewhere here in the ceiling. I want you to look up and I want you to think Jesus. I want you to think Jesus now. As soon as you find that point somewhere up in the sky or up in the ceiling, I want you to focus in and I want us to sing a cappella just that chorus. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. time. Just think of him. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Say after me, God inhabits, God inhabits the praise of his people. He's here. With your heads bowed, please.
in this attitude right now of worship, my dear friend, if you have doubted that you have the ability to become a spiritual strength for the kingdom of God, this morning may be a time, this very minute, to be able to say, Dear Lord, I am a spiritual acorn with the capability to become strong in the kingdom of God. I want you to know that he loves you and he's present here in this building right now. My dear friend, if you would affirm, reaffirm your commitment to him, to stay on the agape road, to not allow Satan or the sin nature of your flesh to derail you. I want you to affirm it now without shame. Just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I'm there. I reaffirm my commitment to the agape road. Hold them up high. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Look this way. There may be some man or woman, some young adult uh, that's in this building right now that you've never invited Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior and Lord. You're, you haven't even got on that road because you haven't made that first time commitment. I want you to know that now in this building before you leave this place, you can settle the issue about your salvation and, ha and walk out of here with the assurance that you're a child of God. In just a few seconds, uh, on this holy ground, here at the altar, up front, by this platform, I'm going to ask as many of you that would come today to say, Pastor, I need to, to make that commitment. Or some of you who are Christians who would come saying, I know I'm saved, but I need a spiritual home. And I want to start brand new with Jesus Christ, and I feel Myrtle Grove Baptist Church is the church that me and my family need to be a part of. If your heart or desire is to make that first-time commitment or to make Myrtle Grove your spiritual home or to publicly rededicate your life, Whatever your need is today, I'm going to have friends down here that are coming right now that will be here in the front. We'll have ladies, if uh, ladies from the congregation need to come, there will be a ladies on hand to pray with you. But whatever need you have now, my friend, I want you to know this is God's time right now. This isn't my invitation. I have no right to give one. I'm only a saved sinner, saved by God's grace. But I have the privilege to extend it on behalf of the Lord. This is His church. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of a new beginning. If you need to come, you make your way down right now. We're going to have folks here to take your hand and pray with you. We'd love to welcome you to this local body of believers called Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. You come now. As Dick leads us in this hymn, I'm going to ask no one leaves the auditorium. You come quietly if you would, please.